Hello there, my name is Michael Whatcott. I'm an apprentice at Clean Coders, and I'm here to present the Game of Life kata implemented in Clojure. The rules that we will be implementing are in the center tab. The very first thing that needs to happen is we need to write code that shows awareness of cells in a grid and the neighbors of a cell. And by neighbors, I mean the the adjacent cells horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. So this first test case is going to help us write that. We're invoking a function called neighbors of, passing it a cell, which is simply a vector with an x and a y coordinate in it. And to begin with, we'll start with the neighbor that is at negative 1, negative 1 from 0, 0. So we have to decrement both the x and the y coordinate in the cell. Easy enough, but we're going to be doing a lot of that kind of arithmetic, so we might as well destructure x and y so it's easier to work with them. And we begin filling out the rest of the first row of neighbors. So you might think of these neighbors as the, the cells to the upper left just above and above and to the right of the cell. So we duplicate uh, the arithmetic and tweak the x values to get that first row going and, and we're looking forward to the next uh, two rows, the middle row and the bottom row, which just have different y values. And we see the pattern of a Cartesian product emerge and so why not refactor to a list comprehension? So that statement there will give us the x range that we need for that first row. Now we can add in the other six cells, the two rows, and do something similar for the y value. Range from y minus 1 up to y plus 2 because the range is closed. Notice that the cell we provided is included and it probably shouldn't be because we're looking for the neighbors of a cell and a cell isn't its own neighbor. So we need to exclude the item that is equal to the inputs. Notice that we're using the special form for the reader that uh, disables or ignores that cell. We'll be using that technique a few times here. All right, now that we can find all eight neighbors of a cell, we want to filter out from a grid the cells that are active. And grids in this, uh, in this example, we're, we're going to say that a grid is a set and an active cell is simply uh, a coordinate that is present in the grid. An inactive cell is not present. So here we're setting up a grid that has four of the neighbors of the cell as the active cells. And we're envisioning a function called count active neighbors that receives the cell and the grid and tells us how many active cells, active neighbors are in the grid. And the, the naive way to implement it is just to count how many cells are in the grid but what if we put an outlier in the grid? That, now that doesn't work, so we have to be a little smarter. Let's imagine this is a series of transformations. We take the cell, get the neighbors of that cell, and then filter out what's not in the grid and take the count. Now this doesn't work because we really should be operating on sets and the grid that we're passing in isn't a set, nor is the neighbors uh, collection. So we turn both of those into sets and it works, so our logic is good, but we'd rather not convert everything to, to sets all the time. What if we passed in a set for the grid? That works just fine. Uh, and now the test is starting to look quite messy um, and we're going to have many more of these tests, so why not extract a few helpers? We'll define the cell at zero, zero, and a convenience function called take neighbors that receives the number of neighbors it uses the cell above gets all eight neighbors takes the number uh, requested 
and then turns that into a set. And we'll be using that a lot. Let's uh, integrate that function. Everything still works. We can now get rid of the set conversion at the end and probably combine the, uh, the conjoining of the grid with the outlier cell. That test now looks much cleaner. We don't need to reference the cell anywhere. We don't need to redefine it, rather. And we might as well use this take neighbors function here as well. We can just take all eight. Now that causes a failure because take neighbors returns a set, so we need to repackage those items in a set. This test case considers four neighbors. We can count four neighbors, but it'd be nice to uh, be more exhaustive in this approach. So we're going to use a list comprehension again to generate test cases. We'll start with just the four case and replace the fours with ends. And that works just fine and you'll notice that the test output is now more specific. And we can now specify that we'd like to run this test across a range of numbers from 0 through 8. And now we are aware of 0 through 8 active neighbors. We're now ready to start considering the task of updating a cell based on its active neighbors. You can see the three rules in the center tab that we'll be implementing. First of all, we should discard active cells that have no active neighbors. So we take zero neighbors to make a grid. It's basically an empty grid at this point. And we call a new function called update cell, passing in the cell and the grid. And let's say that we return nil in the case that we are discarding an active cell. And this passes right out of the gate because blank closure functions just return nil. And it would be nice again to generate multiple test cases based on multiple numeric inputs. So let's install another list comprehension. It should discard active cells with zero active neighbors. How about only one active neighbor? That also works. Now two, if there are two active neighbors of an active cell, we should retain that cell. So we'll make a grid from two of those active neighbors and say that update cell should now return the cell, not just nil. That fails. So we need to count how many active neighbors there are for that cell on the grid and simply say when n or the count of active neighbors is equal to 2, return the cell. Otherwise it will return nil and that passes. The rules also say that uh, we should retain active cells with three active neighbors. So even though it's only two cases, um, we'll install the familiar list comprehension. So the two case works. Now we need to implement three. We can simply change the when statement to a conditional and say, when n is equal to 3, also return the cell. So 2 and 3 have been covered by that new case starting on line 24. We'll add them but ignore them in the previous test case and then fill in the rest 4 through 8 and those all pass. So these two test cases that we've implemented deal with active cells. Now, what about inactive cells? we should revive inactive cells with exactly three active neighbors. So build a grid taking three neighbors. And we should return the cell as a result of calling update cell. And that passes. And it's at this moment that 
we notice that there is a problem with the, the previous two tests. We need to represent that the cell is active by actually adding it to the grid. So that's what we're doing with this conjoin statement here. Add the cell to the grid with n neighbors, signifying that it is active. In this test case we're just adding, we don't conjoin the cell because this cell is inactive. So we should completely ignore inactive cells with anything but three active neighbors. We can just start with a list comprehension right out of the gate here. It's familiar enough, I think. So starting with zero inactive, zero active neighbors around an inactive cell, what we should get is an, another inactive cell. So update cell will return nil. And at this point, I hope you spot the bug faster than I did. Have you seen it? It took me way too long to see this. There it is. So the zero case passes. We can quickly fill in uh, the remaining cases, all but three, which is handled by the previous test case. These test cases uh, are somewhat like table-driven tests from the, the Go community. If you've ever read a bunch of Go code, uh, you've probably seen table-driven tests, and these are this is the very same approach. Okay, so the two case is slightly different. We have to add some additional logic. When a cell is inactive, having two neighbors does not revive it. But when a cell is active, having two active neighbors keeps it active. So there's a slight nuance there in the rules. Also, this take neighbors function seems to favor the beginning neighbors in the collection, so adding a shuffle just make sure that all of these cells get a turn. All right, having implemented all of these rules, we're now ready to try evolving an entire grid of cells. And for this test case, we're going to use an oscillator pattern. Imagine three horizontal cells in a row. They're contiguous. When they are uh, updated, all at the same time, they then produce a vertical column of cells. Both the horizontal and the vertical uh, row and column respectively are centered around the same cell. So we're simply going to pass the first set, which is the first grid uh, of the oscillator, into an evolve function, which we're creating now. And what we should get out is the second state from oscillator. Um, and it might seem like this is a tall order, but we start with a grid. We know we're going to need to manipulate the grid through a series of transformations. And the thread last macro is often a really nice tool for this. Um, so let's start by mapping each cell in the grid to the neighbors of function. This gives us all the neighbors of every cell, each in their own collection. We want to we want to kind of flatten the collection into a single list of, but flatten is recursive and we lose the coordinate relationships. But this apply concat transformation does the trick. And if we uh, filter out the duplicates, you can see that we're getting closer to the, the number of cells that we want. And this map cat function gets rid of the need for that apply concat step. It does that for us. All that's left is to map each cell in play to the update cell function. And now we have a collection of updated cells. All we have to do is re remove the nil value from it and we're finished. This constitutes a complete implementation of the rules of Conway's Game of Life. But let's just make sure that it works over several iterations. So we will cycle over the oscillator pattern, grabbing eight discrete um, 
instances, and we will iterate over evolve the same number of times, and they should both produce the same uh, cycle of oscillations. So those are the rules of the game of life. And now if we plug them in to a graphical application that I've built, we should be able to see them in action. All right, what you're seeing is a grid with some pre-filled uh, values or cells. This pattern is a well-known pattern called a Gosper glider gun, created by Bill Gosper, a mathematician. And I've inserted my own little glider that will wreak havoc with this design. As you can see, there are certain patterns that produce what appear to be gliding shapes just because of the way the cells become active and inactive. And this, uh, this state evolves into a set of still lifes, which I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this presentation of the Game of Life Kata in closure.